All right. Um, my name is Joe Eckley. I'm the Director of Marketing here at Day Air Credit Union. And I want to thank you all for joining us today for this uh, first time home buyer webinar where you're going to learn a little bit about all the things you need to know about buying a home from some of Day Air's uh, best and brightest mortgage experts. However, before we uh, dive in here, I do want to go over just a few housekeeping tips. So first of all, if you have questions throughout the webinar, please use the Q&A button located in your Zoom toolbar. We're gonna to do our best to answer all questions submitted at the end. However, uh, there may be some unanswered questions or if you have questions that are personal in nature, we will address those uh, individually following the webinar. Second, the slide presentation from this webinar is currently available uh, via the chat in a link. And it is also going to be available uh, on our website at dare.org slash webinar hyphen resources. We'll also be sharing the video recording of this webinar at that link uh, within 24 to 48 hours following the conclusion of today's webinar. <clears throat> and finally, for those of you who are, have joined us that are not DARE members currently, uh, we encourage you to join one of the country's premier financial institutions that's located right here in your own backyard in the Miami Valley. You can join in less than five minutes at dayair.org slash start. So without further ado, I'm excited to introduce uh, Greg Allen here to my right and bring in Josh Todd to uh, go through the rest of today's presentation. Yes, thank you guys for joining us on this webinar. We're really excited that you are here and um, encouraged to uh, teach you the best we can about the home buying experience. Um, this is Josh Todd. Josh, you wanna introduce yourself? Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for um, attending. I almost said good morning. I always say good morning. Um, inter brief introductions about us. I'm Josh Todd. I'm the director of real estate lending here at the Credit Union. I've been here for about 13 years, five years or so in uh, mortgage capacity. Uh, Greg Allen to my right is our team leader of the production uh, crew here at the Credit Union. He's one of the top loan officers in the region. So today we're going to take you through what we think you need to know in order to buy a home. Here's our agenda. First, we're going to talk about at length what you need to do before you even consider thinking about buying. Uh, a lot of members come to us and they're really not quite ready. So the aim here is to get you equipped to come to us when you are ready um, and to be prepared. We'll touch a little bit on the process, uh, very briefly on the options. Don't wanna to get too deep into that, but just to give you some general idea of what your options are. And then there are a couple of points I wanna make about your loan after you close that are important. So the before you buy, this slide has three bullet points, and we could probably stop the webinar here, but they are pay your bills, save money, and keep a job. Uh, so we'll elaborate a little bit on those. So paying your bills. I'll jump to the bottom. Paying your bills is all about beating a credit score. You want to have a good credit score. You want to have good credit in order to get a mortgage. Uh, typically, that minimum is 620 give or take, there are some you know, exceptions, some are higher, some are lower. But in general, the higher the score, the better. So how do you get there? You get there by paying your bills. And that can go back to you know, when you're a teenager. A lot of teenagers, I know I had a, I paid my car insurance when I was a teenager. Um, a lot of teens pay their own cell phone bills. Um, a lot of early 20 somethings have the same bills. Those bills traditionally don't report to your credit bureau. Um, but if you don't pay them, they end up on your credit report and it's considered derogatory. Um, Greg, you've seen this in recent uh, weeks and months, starting to see borrowers who self-report or request that your Verizon's report to the credit bureau. Um, but that's kind of a new phenomenon. We're not used to seeing that. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, I thought that was derogatory credit when I first saw it. Right. Yeah. First handful of times. But again, the point is pay your bills, even if they don't report to the credit bureau, because if you don't, they might end up on there and they'll harm you. 
let me talk something to uh, add to the to the to the pay your bills thing. So another thing uh, that a lot of people um, I don't know, say I guess for lack of a better term get wrong about credit is um, I do pay my bills. You know I pay the minimum required monthly payment on all my credit cards. But what you need to understand about credit is that you do not want to roll over any more than a 30% balance, 30% um, limit of your balance. So like if your limit is $1,000 per month on your credit card, you don't want to roll over more than $300 because the minute you start doing that, your score is going to go down because it's actually 35% of the makeup of your credit score is actually based on the available credit you have. So I wanted to just throw that out there. So you can keep those credit cards down, keep them paid off, that's going to raise your score. Absolutely correct. That feeds right into the middle bullet point there, which is to establish credit. Uh, and I worded this this way intentionally. Some borrowers will go out and establish credit and they open up eight or 10 or 12, and I've seen as many as 20 uh, credit cards before. And well, why'd you do that? And the answer is I was just trying to establish credit. So that borrower probably got some bad advice. What we want you to do is establish some credit but not too much. You don't want to go bonkers. One, if you have too many debts, you might not be able to afford another debt, you know, the house. Um, the other thing, on paper, it kind of looks like you don't have any money because you keep applying for credit. So my, my advice to you is to establish some credit. Uh, two, maybe three credit cards. You'll probably buy a car at some point, um, and that's probably sufficient. Um, and Greg spoke about the credit cards. Is exactly right. You'll have so you have a limit of uh, three credit cards with limits of $1,000 each, and that's, that's a pretty low limit. What you don't wanna do is when we go to apply for a mortgage, see $1,000 limit, $800 balance, $900 balance, because it, it kind of looks like you're at the end of your rope financially, even if you're not. Um, so the, the play the credit game, if you will, keep those balances down. Next bullet point is to save money. Uh, the fact of the matter is uh, you need money to own a house. Uh, you need down payment, you need closing costs. And let's face it, when you move in, well, I don't like the carpet. Let's get new carpet. Or the uh, garbage disposal broke. That happened to me. <laughs> I tried to fix it myself. That was not a good <laughs> idea. Um, but you, the bottom line is you need money. So let's talk down payment. Down payment is your skin in the game. That's important for a mortgage. If you put, put down a little skin in the game, you're more likely to keep paying that bill over time. So the down payment ranges between three and 5%. Uh, there are no money down options, but even with those, you still need money. Uh, you need money for your closing costs and uh, the fund your escrow account. And beyond that, um, I know I'm throwing out a lot of terms, but with some no money down products, you need to keep reserves. And what that means is you need savings after closing. And again, feeding right into the last bullet point, sometimes you want different furniture. Sometimes you want new carpet, you might hate the kitchen, you need money for that stuff. And I'm here to tell you that when you buy a house for the first time and you move in, then the first month, one or two things will break. Third bullet point is to keep a job. Job stability is important. If you think about a mortgage, you're taking out, this is a long-term commitment. You're taking out a loan for anywhere from 15 to 30 years, 10 to 30 years. But ordinarily, if you're a first time home buyer, you're probably taking out a 20 or a 30 year loan. That's a long time. And as a lender, you're trying to predict that said borrower will pay us back over those 20 or 30 years. And the, one of the best predictors of that, is your ability to keep paying, is a job history that's stable. So if, if you come to us and you've had three different jobs in the last two years, that may or may not be a problem, but getting and keeping a job helps you uh, obtain a mortgage. So if you're fresh out of college, maybe, and you're working in your field, you can probably still proceed. But if you're, you have a spotty job history, you might have trouble uh, getting a mortgage because it looks like you job, uh, hop from job to job. Um, anything to add to that, Greg? Well, yeah, the hopping, the job hopping, you know, it's, it can be an issue because if you have several jobs, the underwriter may require that you be at your current job for a six month period before you're approved for a mortgage. So that's something to keep in mind. 
if you're staying in the same field, um, that's always the best case when moving from job to job because it just shows a little bit more stability. Um, but that's all I would say about um, keeping a job. Very good. And I think I'm a little bit off my soapbox here. So I think Greg is going to talk the process and I'll hand it over to you. All right. So the process, um, we got four bullet points here. And the first one is to get pre-approved first. Now, there are um, many mortgage types that we can get you pre-approved uh, with. We do offer a full line of mortgage products here at the credit union. We offer conventional, um, which if, when you hear conventional, think traditional mortgage. That's your traditional mortgage you typically use to buy a house with. But then we have other options such as the FHA mortgage, FHA standing for the Federal Housing Authority. And that's a government backed mortgage that's very comparable and competitive with conventional traditional finance. You have USDA and you have VA mortgages as well. USDA is mainly for properties, you're purchasing properties in rural areas out of the cities and VA are for our veterans um, who meet the minimum service requirements. So we have those, all of those products here at the credit union um, but what you're going to do, um, well, let's back up. Let's talk about get pre-approved first. What do you need to do to get pre-approved? How you get pre-approved is you actually will need to fill out an online application or an application with a mortgage lender. And that application is just going to be collecting your general information, running your credit, and then we will also add in your employment and income. And that is all going to determine whether or not you're eligible for a mortgage. Um, and to the bullet point that this is typically the first step you want to take. A lot of people get ahead of the game. They get on realtor.com, they get on Zillow, they look at properties and they're like, oh, I love that. I want to, I want to buy that now. And then they they make it so easy. They have, I'll call the realtor. His number's right there. You can call the realtor. They're going to be interested in what you have to say, but what they're going to tell you is, well, we can't even make an offer until you're pre and that goes to the second bullet on this slide. A normal seller will not accept an offer unless you are pre-approved. So finding a realtor. So that's, um, so realtors are of no cost to you. Uh, if you're using a realtor, they are of great value. They understand the market and they understand the contracts and they help negotiate. And getting back to what I said, they are of no cost to you. Realtors get paid when the deal closes. So unless they help you find a home and help you buy the house, they don't get paid. That's, that's, how, that's how they get paid. So um, to, the bon to the bullet points, their um, realtor does go out and help you find your dream home. And they can, um, and we can also refer you to our trusted partner realtors as well. We have um, very good local realtors who we like to refer out to that um, uh, take really good cares, take really good care of our members. So um, realtors are, are very important and I highly recommend them. Your realtor also help you negotiate the deal. Um, there are some legalities that go into a contract. So a realtor is definitely important. Okay, so Let's back up again, talk about our steps. We got pre-approved for a mortgage. You have a realtor, you're, you're out there and you're making offers on properties. And then all of a sudden you make an offer on a property and the seller accepts your offer. Now what, okay? This is processing the loan. So this is, um, I wanna uh, touch on that these co purchase contracts are all about timing. There are many things within the contract that need to be done by certain times. And typically a normal process to go from start to finish um, completing a mortgage loan for someone um, is when you turn over the purchase contract to me, we're probably looking at about 30-ish days to close. And the reason why that is, is we have to order an appraisal, we have to order a title search, a uh, flood, and then review all of your income and assets with the processor and underwriter. So we have to go through those steps um, during the process. And that typically takes about 30-ish days um, until you're ready to close on the home. Um, but um, the process, um, essentially you're in contract, you hand over the contract to a loan officer, 
and the loan officer will actually set the mortgage um, uh, to the purchase contracts um, standards or to what it states. And then um, we will order appraisal and title work on the property. Once those are back, you'll go through a final underwriting process where they review your income and assets. And then once you clear underwriting, they typically give the clear to close and then we schedule you for closing. So loan closing. So at the close, once you hear clear to close, that's when it's probably the most beautiful victory. three words you'll ever hear. It's victory, you've made it through the process. Um, you will go to the title company and, or you know, you'll meet with the title company because the title company conducts the closing and that's when you get your keys um, typically. So uh, once you close, you get your keys and that's a very tangible thing, re very real, awesome feeling to get. And you can typically walk in your home that day. So let's talk about options. Getting back to pre-approval, we have um, the options I discussed before. So conventional, traditional financing for first time home buyers requires only a 3% down payment. Now, let me define first time home buyer. First time home buyer is someone who has not owned a property in the last three years. If you've owned a property before, but have rented for, the, for more than three years, if you are planning on buying soon, you would actually be considered a first time home buyer again. And the advantage of that is just putting less down. And conventional only requires 3%. FHA is 3.5%. Um, and we do have no money down products as well. Anything, Brad? I'll just add on the no money down products, you still need money. <laughs> no yes. money down should, maybe that should be referred to as no down payment. No down payment, um, yeah. But, you know, it's no money down is the moniker you use in the market. All right, so I'll cover this part after closing. There are some important things to note going in that you're going to have to experience after you're in the home. And those are, I want to describe the payment to you on um, the idea of escrow and escrow analysis, and then the keeping uh, your property in good condition. So the first thing, your actual payment is broken down into components. There's the principal and interest payment. And if you had a car loan, that's what you would call your loan payment. Mm -hmm. Then there's also the T&I, the taxes and insurance. That's the escrow. And when you have a, a, you buy a house, you typically have an escrow account that gets added to, uh, the payment gets added to your principal and interest. And what that serves is we pay your taxes and, and your insurance, I think I just said the microphone. <laughs> we pay your taxes and insurance for you um, which, as a service uh, ongoing. So that goes into this, the TI part of the um, payment. Uh, excuse me. <clears throat> Every year we will reanalyze that. We run an annual escrow analysis. And what that means is that the principal and interest portion of the payment, assuming of a fixed rate loan, is going to stay the same, but the escrow part always changes. And in fact, it's 95% of the time it goes up. But what I'm cautioning you against is going into a house thinking something like, I want a thousand dollar a month house payment. We close the loan and I'm at $998. And then a year from now, like, wait a minute, now it's 1,030. And you know, maybe you're upset about that. The escrow part will go up, so please expect that. Uh, and that's to cover the rising insurance bills, the rising tax bills, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, right now, you're probably aware that housing values are going up. That means Carl Keith here is doing his job by assessing that your house is worth more and charging you more in taxes, so we have to account for that. Same thing goes with your insurance carrier. Your house is now more expensive to rebuild. So your homeowner's insurance policy tends to go up over time. Those two bullet points really fast there. Uh, the last one, uh, buying a house, that's the biggest asset you're probably ever going to buy. Uh, and you, so you wanna take care of it. So we call that deferred maintenance if you don't take care of something. Um, I know I have a gutter on my, the back of my house I have not fixed for two years. That's deferred maintenance, not major, but uh, you want to keep up on the, the repairs of your house, routine repairs. Uh, one, if say you got a job offer somewhere and you had to move, you want to sell the house, you want it to be in the best possible condition so you can maximize whatever your profit is on that. Then another thing, you know, rising housing values, you might have more equity 
and you might want to borrow against that equity. When you do that, we're going to send another appraiser out there to check out the house and you want it to be in good condition. Um, so let's check out the questions. Bear with me, that one, chat, all right. First question was about student loans. Uh, so what was explained about credit? How does that coincide with student loans? If one only has student loans and debt is making minimum payments, how does that affect the application process? You wanna take that one? Yeah, I'll take it. So student loans, okay. So um, they, uh, where do I wanna start with this one? So um, this was actually, you know, student loans have obviously gone up and up and up, tuition rates go up. And so uh, several years ago, this be started to become an issue when the new generation wanted to start to buy houses. So they've made a, diff a few different rules to help us millennials qualify. Um, and, and then, you know, obviously anyone who with, with student loans, but um, here's the rule when it comes to student loans and, and, and credit. So um, one, uh, for conventional finance, there's different rules for different financing. So for, for traditional financing, if you are making a single payment for a bunch of loans, then we can use that one payment you make for all of the loans as a rep representative payment. Okay. That's for conventional financing. FHA is like, um, we know that you have to pay these off someday. So we are going to use a 1% hard rule. 1% of the loan amount is your monthly payment on every student loan that's reporting on your credit report. So that's what they use to determine eligibility in, for your debt to income ratio. So that's how they calculate student loans um, um, in terms of your ability to afford a property. Let me touch on another component of this question, which is if you only have student loan debt, uh, you, you can probably still qualify for mortgage. It'll be a little challenging because you might not have the, a credit card or two or a car loan, mm -hmm. uh, but that's when we get into, again, we're diving into the weeds here a little bit, but we can look at traditional credit. Say you're, uh, you have student loan debt only, but you've been renting a house for a couple of years or an apartment. A lot of times we can obtain that rental history and use that as we call that non-traditional credit to get you qualified. But student loans are definitely a, a challenge on, on some loans. Well, any other questions? You can throw them on there. I think that might have been the only one. Something I did want to um, go back to in terms of the monthly payment, you were kind of hitting it on. Mm -hmm. I just want to touch base as we're waiting for maybe another um, question to roll in. There are five things that are a part of your monthly mortgage payment. It's, it's the mortgage, which has principal and interest. And then you have homeowner's insurance and the property taxes. And we didn't dive into this last one, the fifth one, which is private mortgage insurance. But I did want to touch on that real quick. What is private mortgage insurance? So private mortgage insurance is an insurance policy placed on a mortgage when the borrower does not put 20% down. Now, most borrowers don't have 20% to put down. That is okay. It is a monthly premium that you will pay. Conventional says that once you pay off 20% of your balance, PMI goes away. You no longer have to pay that per month. Something important to know, if you're ever getting financing for an FHA mortgage, the rule is, is that PMI never goes away. Private mortgage insurance is placed on your mortgage from start to finish. Now, obviously you can always refinance out of an FHA product into a conventional product later on. Um, to get rid of your PMI, but I just wanted to, to clarify the five things that are a part of your monthly mortgage payment, uh, getting back to what you were talking about earlier. So, another one. Okay, we got a few more questions coming in. How long does the process of pre-approval process take? So, um, the process to get pre-approved can be done actually within a day. Um, mainly, it's about completing the application, um, once we have a complete application, our system actually does auto-generate um, pre-approval. And um, once you're pre-approved, like, like we stated before, you're ready to buy a house. So that actually can be done 
um, in a day. Now, how long is it good for? How long is your pre-approval good for? Maybe that's the second part of this question, 120 days. So your pre-approval um, lasts 120 days from application date. After that, all we have to do in order to renew your um, pre-approval status is to um, create a new application. And these days it's taking folks that long to find a house. Mm -hmm. so the market's so hot that sometimes they have to uh, re-up yes. their yes. uh, pre-approval. Another question, if I already have a realtor, who works with a financial institution, do I still have the option to go somewhere else like Bay Area? Yes, uh, realtors have relationships with lenders uh, and they usually have relationships with a couple, um, but you always have the option to choose your own financing. That doesn't mean the realtor won't say, hey, I have a good working relationships with, with this lender or that lender. But yeah, you always have that option. Mm -hmm. Good question. Yeah. Let's see, any others? That might be it. So one thing I, I will want to uh, just state here towards the end, you know, if you are thinking about um, buying a home, um, do reach out to us. Please reach out to us. We we'd love to help you. We have a few uh, lending officers who you know help members every day um, get pre-approved and and help them on their way to purchase a home. So we had one more question come in, Greg. I, um... What should we know about government assistance programs for first time home buyers? Um, the best and simplest advice is to get a hold of us. There are a lot of different programs, but not every lender participates in every program. Um, rather than you know, listing programs, uh, that's probably best to just get in touch with us. The one we do participate in is called the Welcome Home Program that's going on right now. It's not really a federal uh, government program, but uh, we can get you $5,000 to buy a home. And it's usually only in the March and April timeframe. Yeah, we're towards the end of that um, period. Um, but yeah, we do have that. It's called a welcome home grant, $5,000 grant to help you purchase a home and goes towards down payment, closing costs and prepaids, which are prepaying into your escrow account. So that can be applied. Um, it still is available, um, but we expect it to be probably um, ending um, here in the next few weeks. Did get another question. Good, keep, keep asking. Yes, please. <laughs> Is there any difference in the process for a non-citizen legally working under a working permit, like any extra documentation needed? Um, we ordinarily want you to be a permanent resident. There are no prohibitions against uh, non-permanent citizens from um, folks who aren't going to be here permanently. Obtaining a mortgage, it just really depends on them. Mm -hmm. uh, we generally want you to be, be around, so we want you to be here. So, so to follow up too, and add a little bit more to that question, um, as long as we can prove that you're actually legally here um, on a work visa or, or any permit, um, you can actually get pre-approved for a traditional conventional mortgage, but FHA does require you to be a permanent resident. I think we have another one. How does running the credit or pre-approval affect our credit score? We tried a couple of years ago to get pre-approved, but our debt to income ratio wasn't where it needed to be because of student loans, both making more money, but I don't know if it is worth trying. So the basic question there is how does a credit inquiry affect your credit score? One credit inquiry here and there is not really going to have a substantial effect on your score. It might depress it a few points. Um, a credit score is a dynamic thing. It, it changes at any moment, depending on when you uh, pull it. Mm -hmm. But what you don't want to do is apply everywhere. Yes. Um, if you're applying often, that can depress your score quite a bit. So again, you know, you know applying at one, one or two places isn't going to hurt you. Mm -hmm. It is, I should add, it is a hard hit when you apply for a mortgage, but that's every, anywhere you go. Um, we have to look into every detail in terms of your credit to make sure that um, we're following the correct guidelines and uh, making sure that we can get you pre-approved. I think we're good there. I'll close that. <laughs> all right, that's all we had for you this afternoon. We thank you for uh, attending. If you have any other questions, please uh, visit our website. and. Uh, I hope everybody has a great day.
Yes, thank you for coming to this webinar and hopefully we'll talk to you soon.